Good afternoon, dear colleagues and respectable attendants. We are going to start our next session with a lecture entitled Practical Approach to Uterine Sarcomas. The lecture will be presented by uh, Professor uh, Joseph Carlson, United States of America. Uh, just to let you know, Professor Carlson is a professor of clinical pathology in the Department of Pathology at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. He is an associate director of Surgical Pathology Medical Center with responsibility for gynecological pathology. Have a nice time. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph Carlson, and it's a pleasure to be giving this first lecture, a uh, practical approach to uterine sarcomas. I hope that the audio and video is working well. Um, I can say that I'm recording this at home. It's a holiday now in the United States for Martin Luther King Jr. And um, I have my dog with me in the room. So I'm just telling you in case I need to let him out. Uh, that there might be small interruptions here and there. This is part of life recording a lecture at home. So um, anyway, without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, share, Microsoft PowerPoint, share. Okay, let me go back to my first slide. Great. So yes, so this will be approximately a 35 minute lecture giving some ideas about a practical approach to uterine sarcomas. Um, I do have some um, disclosures. I have been a paid speaker from Roche, and these are the organizations I've received funding from, uh, all of them in Sweden, so it's probably not an issue. So there's a ever-expanding list of mesenchymal tumors in the uterus. So this is just an example showing over the past 70 years the increase in publications using the search term uterine mesenchymal tumors. Back in 1951, there were two publications that year. And you can see in 2022, there were 177 publications. So things have increased rapidly. Um, and we need to plan our approach, just like this mountain climber far above this city um, yes, we have to think about each step we make carefully and plan our approach to tackling these tumors. And so what I really would like to urge is that we do not forget the basics. This is essentially, um, you know, really key. Do not get caught up in the tumor and forget the basics. Um, review and categorize the histology carefully. We're gonna discuss some of the current and emerging subtypes of mesenchymal tumors, and we're gonna talk a little bit about using ancillary studies. So when I say the basics, what I mean are the kinds of things that we tell our trainees and we emphasize. That is to say, really careful attention to the clinical and surgical aspects of the case. So these are sort of the pre-analytical factors. That is to say, in a sense, all the things happening before we sit with a slide and look under the microscope. Uh, I really think it's important to emphasize this because I do think a lot of us, and I'm guilty of this as well, we end up at the microscope, looking at our slides, we probably, we may or may not still do our own uh, gross dissection. Uh, we may or may not be looking in the charts ourselves. We may have people to help us with some of that. And it's very easy to get caught up in the slides and then a desire to move forward from the slides. That is to say, to go straight to immunohistochemistry and ancillary molecular studies. But you cannot overcome some of the clinical and surgical aspects that might help you with your diagnosis. You can't skip those important steps. Things like hereditary factors. So for example, a patient with um, um, tuber sclerosis, well, then you immediately know that this patient is at risk for developing pecomas. So that will guide your evaluation. Um, the same way a patient that has had perhaps a, a a tumor in the kidney. Well, then they might have renal cell carcinoma and 
leiomyomatosis syndrome. So then you might be thinking that they have an FH deficient leiomyoma. Surgical aspects such as was this case known to be a sarcoma preoperatively or not? If it was not, then there's a good chance that the case has not been well fixed because a lot of our benign tumors, our benign leiomyomas, are just uh, unopened, put into formalin, and the formalin will quite simply not penetrate into the tumor. You have to make sure there's adequate sections to truly represent the histology. And I am a firm believer in a careful and a calm histologic evaluation. So when I'm studying a sarcoma, I like to go into my office, shut the door, put on some nice music, do not disturb, and just take it easy, go through the slides methodically and carefully on my own, trying to make the most unbiased opinion I can about what I'm seeing in front of me. These are cases that often will require discussion, reading, and review. So you'll want to show them to your colleagues and discuss them. Um, and then once you've done all of these things, you start to make your differential diagnosis and you reach for your immunohistochemistry. So some of these we've mentioned, the clinical aspects, the surgical aspects, who is this patient, what age, what procedure was performed? Was the specimen open and placed in formalin rapidly? Did it sit unfixed? If it did, for how long? Unexpected sarcomas are unfortunately the, the norm in the uterus. In one study, 67% of sarcomas were identified only after surgery for a, a leiomyoma. Um, leiomyomas and bleeding symptoms are extremely common, and the preoperative workup for these conditions is quite limited, at least in the United States. Maybe an ultrasound, depends on the, the patient, their age, but it can be quite cursory. Thus, sarcomas will often be mixed in with benign resections. I would emphasize that it's good, if possible, to try to minimize degeneration and autolysis. So an unopened uterus placed in formalin and then at room temperature, it will not fix. And you're essentially in a race between the formalin penetrating the tumor. It penetrates about one millimeter per hour, um, so not very quickly and the, uh, the autolysis that's happening at room temperature. So one simple thing that we can all do is try to put our benign specimens in the fridge, okay? So if possible, it can be a good investment to have a fridge uh, somewhere near the operating room. So when the surgeons finish their surgery, they can just put the specimens in the fridge. Uh, I say that because even just bringing a, a, a specimen down to four degrees centigrade can help reduce some of the autolysis can allow the specimen to be taken in pathology, to be examined, to be opened, uh, and then placed into Forlin so it can fix better. So the WHO has a long list of mesenchymal tumors of the uterus, as well as mixed epithelial mesenchymal tumors and mesenchymal tumors of the lower genital tract. So I'm gonna focus on the lesions in bold. Um, which I think are some of the most relevant to our discussion. And just to pluck that list out and put them in the order that we're gonna discuss them, these are the lesions that I'm gonna discuss. Okay, so we'll start with the smooth muscle tumors. We'll move into see some of the other uterine tumors. Then we'll focus on some of the endometrial tumors. And finally, we'll end with an emerging tumor, the N-track rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. So smooth muscle tumors are a good place to start because they're the most common. And right off the bat, I would like to emphasize to everyone to please categorize your tumors into spindle cell, which is the most common type, epithelioid or myxoid. Um, I say that, and of course, the majority will be spindle cell tumors, all right? The vast majority. I mention that because I do think it's nice when I read a report to see that the pathologist has actually taken the time to indicate whether the tumor is spindle cell or the other two rare types. And I'm sorry, now my dog wants me to open the door. So just a moment. Oh, you wanna go out? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No? All right. Sorry about that. You wanna confirm that it's a smooth muscle tumor. 
using perhaps uh, histology and or immunistic chemistry. And then, of course, we're looking for the three main things, mitotic rate, atypia, and necrosis, right? Um, I should mention that in addition to mitotic rate, atypia, and necrosis, which are the main ones, in the especially in the epithelioid and myxoid tumors, we're going to be looking for areas of infiltration uh, and also the gross impression of whether the tumor is myxoid or not. So these are also important factors uh, when we're considering the criteria for malignancy. Mitotic index, we want to use strict criteria. Is it a mitosis? We want to be aware of apoptotic cells, pycnotic nuclei, lymphocytes. Um, the mitotic index in the uterus uh, is not as prognostic as it is at other sites and with other smooth muscle tumors at other sites. That is to say that a benign leiomyoma can have a high mitotic index. Apoptotic cells are typically round oval cells with dark eosinophilic cytoplasm. They have dense nuclei. Pycnotic cells, the nucleus fades, shrinks, and becomes fragmented. Okay. Here's an image showing just a standard mitosis from this paper, very nice paper by Drs. Toledo and Oliva. Um, this is a paper that I still go to, um, looking at a practical approach to smooth muscle tumors. Um, Nuclear atypia, as described, and as we know, we should stay at low to moderate power when we're assessing nuclear atypia. Everything looks atypical when we go to high power. So we're talking about 4x to 10x on your objective. And what I do is I will compare with the normal smooth muscle. You want to consider pleomorphism, but I would also recommend considering hypercremasia irregularity in the nuclear membrane, and of course, an increase in the nuclear size. So even if the nuclei don't show that much pleomorphism, you want to take into account these other factors. So here, for example, is, an, is a case showing uh, this hyperchromasia, these pleomorphic nuclei, um, even at what is essentially a moderate power, right? So this is the sort of high-grade atypia that we're looking for. Tumor cell necrosis is only seen in Lama sarcoma. It's an abrupt transition from necrotic to non-necrotic tumor areas without any interposed granulation or fibrous tissue. The vessels are usually viable. It's very rare to find tumor cell necrosis as the only finding in a Lama sarcoma or a stump. Um, in one series of 77 Lama sarcomas, all of them, except for one case, if there was tumor cell necrosis present, they also had my, a high mitotic index and atypia. So let's take a moment and focus on the spindle cell smooth muscle tumors. So spindle cell lyoma sarcoma, of course, the most common. As we mentioned, they're often operated mistakenly as lyomyoma. It's the most common uterine sarcoma. It makes up 1% to 2% of all uterine malignancies, and it's typically found in women over 50 years of age. There is a rare association with tamoxifen and pelvic irradiation, but these are so rare that they're probably not particularly useful in clinical practice. The pathogenesis, these tumors are karyotypically complex. So the majority show uh, what's called karyorexis, that is to say shattering of the chromosomes with massive gains and losses. They show frequent TP53 mutations, ATRX, and MED12. The histopathology, as we've mentioned, they show high-grade atypia, tumor necrosis, and a high mitotic rate. The immunohistochemistry, they're positive for our typical smooth muscle markers, smooth muscle lactin, desmin, and h desmin. Prognosis, overall survival for all stages, 15 to 25%, and they really show a very limited response to chemotherapy. If we move on to the myxoid smooth muscle tumors, a much more challenging area in many ways, these grossly show this jelly-like cut surface. With the myxoid lyoma sarcoma and the myxoid smooth muscle tumors, evaluation of the tumor margin is important. So you want to get an idea if the tumor was infiltrated or well circumscribed. It requires that greater than 50% of the tumor shows this myxoid change. And of course, they have totally distinct criteria for malignancy. This is perhaps a good place to mention the uh, so-called towel test. 
So when you cut open a tumor and it looks sort of wet and maybe jelly-like, what you can do is set the tumor on a paper towel. Um, if the towel becomes wet as it soaks up the liquid, then what you're seeing is hydropic degeneration, essentially edema. However, if the towel does not become wet, but rather sticks to this jelly-like surface, then that's true myxoid change. There are currently three different criteria, three different um, algorithms for determining malignancy. Um, they're quite similar. This is the one that I think is the most, uh, I, I prefer this one. Um, notice that it starts with evaluation of the border of the tumor, circumscribed border or an infiltrative border. Then comes an evaluation of atypia. And if you have an infiltrative border with moderate to high grade atypia, it's probably a lyoma sarcoma. Um, so basically you can work your way through this table but um, notice this issue with the infiltrative border. This can be one of the most challenging. And this, I think, is an example of when it's important not to sit just at the microscope with our slides, but you may have to go back, take out the specimen, and really look at the remaining tissue to see if the border of the tumor is infiltrative or not. Here's just an example from that paper showing a myx myxoid lama sarcoma. Here we see the infiltration of the myxoid tumor into the surrounding smooth muscle. Here again, showing both uh, the more hypocellular myxoid and more hypercellular areas. And then a close-up showing this myxoid change with the tumor cells embedded in this matrix. Moving on to the epithelioid smooth muscle tumors. These have rounded polygonal cells in greater than 50% of the tumor. They may lack this world gross appearance and instead can be softer or tan. They have round nuclei with an eosinophilic cytoplasm in greater than 75% of cases. They can have a clear or evaculated cytoplasm. And there's many different growth patterns, such as in a benign example, lyomyoblastoma. So epithelioid lyoma sarcoma, there's very little experience with this tumor. Um, there's few published series, and they require extensive sampling to find or not find the areas that are demonstrating the malignant, the criteria for malignancy. So if you have an epithelioid tumor, it's important to go back to the specimen and make sure that you have at least one per centimeter, maybe 1.5 sections per centimeter. The criteria, at least two of three features are present, moderate to severe cytologic atypia, at least three to four mitoses per 10 high power field and tumor cell necrosis. When there's only one feature present, then you can consider a diagnosis of stump, so smooth muscle tumor of uncertain malignant potential. Stump, um, I wanna make a comment that the morphologic features of stump exceed those allowed for lyomyoma or its subtypes, but do not allow you to make a diagnosis of lyomyoma sarcoma. I would, I would personally recommend that we do not make the diagnosis of stump on a biopsy. There's many reasons why a biopsy may not be diagnostic for a uterine mesenchymal tumor. And obviously sampling is first and foremost the reason. But uh, just because sampling is an issue doesn't mean we should call it stump. In a biopsy, I will typically say something like um, smooth muscle with and then whatever you have, atypia, foci of necrosis, whatever. Um, the features are concerning for lama sarcoma. Um, the material is limited and insufficient for a, a categorical diagnosis, something like that. Um, I really reserve stump for resection specimens where the entire specimen can be evaluated. There's essentially, according to the WHO, four primary areas where we're considering the diagnosis of stump. Um, it's a heterogeneous diagnosis. As I mentioned, these are tumors that have more concerning features than a lyomyoma, but do not fulfill the criteria for lyoma sarcoma. So for example, we can have tumors with uh, nuclear atypia um, and a relatively high mitotic index, but the mitotic index is just not quite enough to call lyomyosarcoma. 
We can have tumors with tumor cell necrosis, but no other worrisome features. So this would be an example of tumor cell necrosis being the only K, only criteria that's present. Um, some of these have recurred. The problem is that we know that tumor cell necrosis has a relatively poor reproducibility. So that this seems like a good area to call a tumor a stump. We can have tumors that are lacking cytologic atypia and tumor cell necrosis, but have an extremely high mitotic index. So for example, a tumor with a mitotic index greater than 15 mitoses per 10 high power field. And finally, we can have tumors with diffuse nuclear atypia, but where the mitotic index is dif difficult to measure, uh, difficult to count because they have brisk prominent karyorexis. Okay, so this is just an example of some of the areas where we might enter entertain a diagnosis of stump. Why can't we always make a diagnosis on a biopsy? Sometimes the biopsy is sufficient, sometimes it isn't. It truly depends. So it's difficult to say, uh, you know, what are the criteria for like adequacy in a biopsy? Because sometimes it can be enough, sometimes it's not. So this is one of those difficult areas. So leaving behind the smooth muscle tumors, moving on to pecomas, so perivascular epithelial cell tumors. These also present with vaginal bleeding, a pelvic mass and pelvic pain. The age is similar, but can occur in younger women. Typically they're sporadic, but they can be associated with the hereditary syndrome of tuberous sclerosis. I should emphasize that sometimes patients don't know that they have tuberous sclerosis. So uh, if you diagnose a pecoma, you should recommend that the patient sees uh, hereditary counseling. Inactivating mutations of TSC1 and TSC2 lead to upregulation of mTOR. They can also have TFE3, RAD51B, or these other fusions. And these tumors show a particular histopathology with these epithelial to spindle cells with a clear to eosinophilic cytoplasm. The immunohistochemistry is characteristic because they show mixed smooth muscle and melanocytic differentiation. So they'll be positive for SMA Desmond and H. Desmond, and they'll also be positive for HMB45 and melan A. Note, we say positive, but it's important to remember that when we're evaluating HMB45 and melan A, even one cell, according to the literature, can be enough. So how do we apply the immunohistochemistry? First, if you're looking at a case where you only have one or two HMB45 positive cells, I would say that requires a good histomorphology. The reason I say that is that HMB45 has been documented to be positive in normal smooth muscle. Therefore, HMB45 is not specific for a diagnosis of pecoma. Uh, so if I'm going to have a case where there's limited HMB45 staining, then I'm going to want to have a, a relatively good histology. That is to say, histology that catches the eye as being not the typical lyomyoma. Melan A is much more specific in the diagnosis of pecoma, and there's also a marker called cathepsin K, which is relatively sensitive. That is to say, it's positive in all, almost all pecomas, but also has somewhat limited specificity. These tumors are divided into benign, malignant, and also in a group called uncertain malignant potential. And it's important to make the diagnosis because mTOR inhibitors are considered in their therapy. So here's an example of a pecoma. Notice the round nuclei, the nucleoli, and this sort of granular cytoplasm. Here's another example of a, pe example of a pecoma with a very classic histology. Notice how the cytoplasm has these little strands running through it that look like cobwebs or spider webs or look um, sometimes are called spider cells because it's almost like or moth moth eaten cells because it's almost like if you imagine a piece of cloth that you poke holes in and it's hanging by these little threads okay so this is very typical for a pecoma and here's just a high power showing these sort of strands and threads between uh, within the cytoplasm Okay, so this is very characteristic for a pecoma.
And here's an HMB45 staining. This is quite a lot of staining, I would say. Um, this is obviously much more than just one cell. Um, but if you have the right histology, you may need to chase that HMB45. And I've even heard of colleagues staining multiple blocks with HMB45 in order to find the rare cells that are positive. Here are the criteria. So here's two different sets of criteria. As you can see, what we're evaluating is the nuclear grade, the mitotic count, the presence or absence of necrosis, the presence or absence of vascular invasion, um, and, and the presence or absence of an infiltrative margin. Okay. Um, I personally prefer the GYN specific criteria, but some people perhaps prefer the general criteria. Um, in a given case, I would say typically, probably, if it ends up being malignant with one criteria, it probably ends up being malignant with the other. I think it must be very rare cases that end up, you know, one criteria systems calling it uncertain malignant potential and the other is malignant. Okay. But these are difficult tumors. <clears throat> adenosarcoma. So adenosarcoma. These tumors present with vaginal bleeding or a pelvic mass or with tissue protruding from the cervix. They can often have a history of recurrent polyps. So whenever I read someone had recurrent polyps, and then I look in the microscope and I have polyps, I always get kind of nervous. They can have a wide age range. Most of them are postmenopausal. And it's believed to be sporadic through the transformation of a Mullerian mesenchymal stem cell. There appears to be some association with tamoxifen, they are solitary exophytic tumors with cleft-like or dilated glands with this diagnostic periglandular cuffing. Sarcomatous overgrowth is the presence of pure sarcoma, that is to say, a region in the microscope with no epithelial component comprising at least 25% of the tumor. Note that sarcomatous overgrowth does not have to be high grade, okay? So sometimes, um, sometimes you just have this adenosarcoma and then you have a region which looks like mesenchymal overgrowth um, that's 25% of the tumor. That is sarcomatous overgrowth. So that is a risk factor that needs to be reported. Um, it's useful to report if high-grade sarcoma is present. It's interesting. Um, but it's unclear what we can do with that information. The risk factor is sarcomatous overgrowth. There is no specific immune histochemistry for adenosarcoma. So this is a diagnosis where you may need to do things like consult your colleagues, open the books, open some papers. Invasion of the myometrium and sarcomatous overgrowth are poor prognostic indicators. If the tumor is located only in the endometrium and it has no myoinvasion and there's no sarcomatous overgrowth, they have 100% survival. If there is sarcomatous overgrowth in a small study, then there's only a 20% progression-free survival, okay? Note that we're talking about uterine adenosarcoma here. Ovarian adenosarcoma and extrauterine adenosarcoma has a worse prognosis. And that's probably related to the fact that there's no physical barrier to spread, whereas in the uterus, of course, we have the myometrium. So the histology, Tubular dilated cleft-like glands. I've already gone through these, but just to emphasize them. Periglandular cuffing. Note that stromal mitotic activity is frequently found, but it is not required. It is not required, okay? Um, as well as stromal cellular atypia. So here's a gross photo of an adenosarcoma. Look how it's filling the uterine compartment. And here's a very nice low power image showing this cuffing. I can say that honestly, I think cuffing is easier to appreciate at low power than at high power. At high power, when we go into those areas with cuffing, we can see the atypia and cellularity. We don't have to find mitoses, right? So just to emphasize again, we do not need mitoses. If you're looking at something with cuffing and increased cellularity and atypia, and you're thinking of a diagnosis of uh, adenofibroma because you can't find mitoses. Adenofibroma has essentially been removed. So consider adenosarcoma. And here's just showing that stromal overgrowth. Architecturally, they really resemble a phyloides tumor. Let me just take a peek at the time, make sure I'm not, I'm on pace. Okay. Utrust, 
These also have abnormal uterine bleeding. They're well circumscribed and they have sex cord differentiation. Um, now we know that they do have some fusions that are characteristic. They're benign, but there have been some rare occurrences reported. Inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. These show abnormal uterine bleeding um, and they have these ALK rearrangements. Okay, we're going to move in the endometrial stromal tumors now. Endometrial stromal nodule is a well-circumscribed tumor that resembles endometrial stroma, but it has no invasion of the surrounding myometrium and no lymphovascular space invasion. There really is no specific immunohistochemistry. CD10 is not specific for endometrial stroma. Okay, so be careful. Here's just a gross photo of an endometrial stromal nodule. This is the appearance we expect for benign endometrial stroma. Low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. It should have a similar appearance. That is to say, it resembles endometrial stroma, but there's invasion or lymphovascular space invasion. There's a number of translocations that have been described, which I've listed here. And again, there's no specific immunohistochemistry, but they're typically CD10 positive. There's an interesting marker called IFITM1, typically ERPR positive, and focal cyclin D1. And they have an indolent clinical course. Okay. Here's an example of the invasion from a low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma with this sort of large finger-like invasion. Here's an example of this permeative lymphovascular space invasion. So they really invade, like people talk about opening the uterus and it looks like a bag of worms where the tumor is pushing its way into the lymphovascular spaces. High-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma is a heterogeneous diagnosis. There's three molecular types. One has the YWHAE NUTM2AB translocation. One has B core, and one has no specific molecular translocation. But what it will have is a low grade endometrial stromal sarcoma component and then a transformation to a high grade component. The histology differs. So the YWHAE translocation typically has round or spindle cell areas. The B core often has myxoid change. And then I'm going to show you a table in a second for the immune chemistry. And these are more aggressive than low-grade endometrial stromal sarcomas. So here's a table going through some of the immune histochemistry. As you can see, the endometrial stromal nodule and the low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma, uh, they have this patchy cyclin D1, whereas the YWHAE high-grade component, that is to say the more cellular component, they will be diffusely positive for cyclin D1 and diffusely positive for B-core. The B-core translocated sarcomas have this patchy B-core, but they also have some smooth muscle marker positivity as opposed to the YWHA translocation sarcomas. So obviously these are easier to sort out if you have access to molecular testing. Um, and if you have access to cyclin D1 and B-core immunohistochemistry. These were described in this paper. Um, and here's just some histology of the YWHAE translocated tumors with this low-grade component. Undifferentiated uterine sarcoma is, is clearly a diagnosis of exclusion where they have no identifiable line of differentiation. Um, we've performed research on these papers and we identified four molecular subgroups, one of which um, showed ex overexpression of developmental genes, one which was sarcoma like one which overexpressed extracellular matrix genes, and one which had uh, overexpression, or sorry, uh, a low proliferation. Just trying to keep track of the time, excuse me. Here's an example, a gross photo of an undifferentiated uter uterine sarcoma showing the necrosis. Here's the high-grade histology and multiple mitoses. Again, high-grade histology with multiple mitoses. And now to finish up, I want to talk a little bit about the NTRK rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. These are actually grouped in the WHO with the tumors of the lower genital tract because they're found in the cervix, but also can be found in the vagina. Um, typically reproductive age, so between the ages of 23 to 44. The etiology of them is unknown, but they very importantly have this NTRK rearrangement, 
The reason why it's important to know about these tumors is because the end track rearrangement um, can be targeted with a specific um, targeted therapy to which the patients respond, uh, potentially respond well. Uh, they have uniform spindle cells with mild to moderate atypia and inconspicuous nucleoli. They have this staghorn vascular pattern in necrosis. By immunohistochemistry, they're positive for S100, CD34, an antibody called TRK, which is an antibody to the N-track translocation, and cyclin D1, and they are negative for ERPR, CD10, SMA, Desmin, and BCOR. Prognosis is variable. Some of the tumors are associated with a protracted clinical course. They were very nicely described in this recent paper by Dr. Atanescu. And here is just an example of this sort of uh, low-grade sort of fibrosarcoma appearance to the tumor cells. Again, this sort of uh, spindle cell appearance with these medium fascicles and some showing these sort of symplastic giant cells. And here's an example of the immunist chemistry showing this S100 positivity, the CD34 positivity, and this positivity with the TRK antibody, which can be very useful, especially if you don't have access to molecular testing. Thank you. That's uh, all that I have to present today. Um, these are some pictures of the members of my lab. Uh, my co-PI, Dr. Tirza Bryce petta um, some of the PhD students in the group. Thank you very much. So I didn't leave a lot of time for questions and discussion because there will be a discussion at the end. Um, and at that point, I'll be joining um, live. So I hope that we'll have a chance to discuss some of the lesions that I went over. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Now we have our next talk uh, about the uh, 